evening and welcome to the meeting of the Northampton School Committee on Thursday, July 12, 2012. If we could have a roll call, please. Mr. Alden Bourne. Yeah. Um, it's I'm here now. Ms. Blue Duval. Present. Uh, Mr. Michael Flynn. Our census regrets. Mr. Downey Meyer. Ms. Lisa Vinnick. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Mayor David Nockowitz. Is absent at City Council. Ms. Stephanie Pick. Here. Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Here. Mr. Ed Zahowski. Present. Madam Vice Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Seeing no one in the audience, I guess we don't have a public comment period today. Are there any announcements? I have one. Um, on August 3rd, Ward 3 is having a garden tour which is a fundraiser for them, but some of those funds went to the Bridge Street School for their garden, and so the Bridge Street School garden is on the tour. No, excuse me, it's not August, it's August 4th. It's Saturday, August 4th. And you're all invited to go, it's a wonderful community event, you'll meet many people. Any other announcements? Moving right along, I'm on our consent, consent agenda, we have approval of the school committee meeting minutes from Thursday, June 14th, school committee meeting from Thursday, June 28th, do we have any, uh, we have um, two contracts for a Lower Pioneer Valley Collaborative in the amount of $11,975.26 and to Alan Marini for $8,523.60 and we have a field trip request, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? No? no? I thought we had one. No, maybe we don't. We a placeholder. No. So those two uh, consent agenda are those um, two sets of minutes and the um, the two contracts. Move to approve. Second. Is there any discussion or question about any of these? Ready to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. So <clears throat> moving right along, we are up to reports and recommendations, and the first would be our business manager's report. As usual, in your in your package, you have a uh, one-page business manager report from myself. Uh, the FY13 uh, budget, as it was approved on the 14th of June, is uploaded and on the school website. So, if you want, you will see the entire booklet that was handed out. It is uploaded, so you can uh, uh, see it at your leisure. Um, also, the uh, renovation for the Clark School uh, is beginning this week. July 9th, the start of this week. The uh, two contracts you have, uh, one addition uh, that's there that you have just talked about and approved. Um, one is for FY12, one is for FY13 using capital funds. Um, also, in your packet, you have a financial statement as of June 30th. Uh, we are right now in the middle of still closing out the fiscal year for FY12. And we are still making adjustments in journals, uh, transfers, encumbering monies. Uh, the report that you have in front of you here was uh, cut off, uh, uh, David, I cut off, I cut off on the 9th uh, to print off the report to get it to you. There is still other adjustments in journals that are happening. Um, the balance that's on the report that you have right now is $237,972. Um, with the various journals and transfers, that will come down to zero. Um, as we close out the fiscal year, that will uh, balance out. We will use up uh, any of the uh, uh, monies that are in our grants to maximize the uh, amount of expenditures and any monies in our choice and other revolvings. So that kind of summarizes uh, the financial report. Again, you will get another report like this in August when all the transfers are made, all the journals, all the adjustments, and everything has uh, tied out. This is where we are as a journal. Hey guys, I was just curious. Do we um, do we know? We had a couple of like three, did, you know, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of overages from what we budgeted. Do we know that was because it was more than expected? Because or because we intentionally budgeted low, or you know, do we? You do, um, and I, one of those lines is probably the line that says uh, medical therapeutic services. Uh, in the last, uh, I'm going to say, 
30 days, that account has uh, jumped up uh, tremendously. There's, a, there's been a lot of expenses that had finally come through uh, through the special ed department more than uh, was anticipated and uh, hitting it, hitting that line at the, at the very end. It wasn't as if we under budgeted, it was just more expenses coming through. So the consultant therapist uh, performed services throughout the year and gives the bill, of course, at the end of June, so they get it in the end of the fiscal year, but that it's not just for the rent. Right, I understand. Right, I understand. Right. Right. It was the, the billing right. was done then. Uh, the, 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 we want vendors to bring us their bill at the end of June. <laughs> If one of the other lines you were looking at was just below that was paraprofessional and aides, yes, we did have more paraprofessionals and aides on uh, on staff during this past fiscal year, and that's why that number has uh, jumped up. You also have to remember this this particular financial statement in includes um, all the balloon payments that are received as part of the teacher's contract. It also includes the payments. Uh, when teachers take their pays over a 26 pay period, so they still will be being paid for the month of July and the month of August. And uh, because those are truly FY12 expenses, I, through a number of uh, other adjustments, bring those back into this fiscal year because they belong to this fiscal year's uh, accounting. So there are uh, all the payroll expenses and other things that have been pulled in to this point. There are still some others that are happening, but those are the big ones. Let's see. Uh, FY13 budget, it's up on the website. Uh, the FY12 budget, again, we're still closing and we should end at zero with all the adjustments that, that are there. The uh, food service department, uh, the software notification module has been purchased. Uh, the company that's uh, installing that has been in to uh, upgrade, increase some memory in our machines. Uh, it has started to upload the software in each of the individual machines uh, throughout the district. Uh, we will most likely do a, a, a dry run, a test run of that sometime during the summer, but that software contract that you had approved, uh, I, I think it was either in June or May, um, we're now implementing that and that will be online. So come the fall, you will be able to see balances and see uh, information on our students or you know, your parents will be able to see what your child's balance is. So that's moving we'll right along. Uh, the athletic department expenses, um, uh, 3510 and, and it's 102. The, uh, the next year we was voted in for $10,000 more and yet we're all, only down 4067 So did we over that for next Blue, year? Blue, which line are you looking at? I'm looking at 3510 athletic department expenses and we have a, as an available budget negative for and it's a percent used is 102.4% and yet in next year's budget it was voted in for ten thousand dollars extra there and i see that we didn't use that i mean it, it's like six thousand dollars i'm just wondering if we over if we over um adjusted for for the athletics i i don't believe you have um this number here that shows a minus four thousand mm -hmm. um that's also as a result of major adjustments that uh, Jim Miller has made to the athletic program uh, since we met with him back in January and reduction changes and, and uh, trying very hard to hold all the expenses in the athletics. Um, if uh, we didn't meet with him, I'm anticipating that number would have been higher. I think $10,000 that was voted by the committee during the budget process is really an appropriate amount of money for the athletics. Um, if you're already in the in, in you know minus in the hole right now, we are going to have to you know adjust and compensate for that because you know he spent more than what was uh, really allocated uh, in the budget. So actually, for our FY13 budget, then we're actually just still catching up instead of moving it around because I'm also concerned about um, line 2415 other instructional materials where it's 113.4 and. For our supplies, we voted a zero for the schools, and now we have an available budget of negative twenty-seven thousand eight hundred forty-eight seventy-nine. Um, I'm wondering 
about that one also. Okay, let me just go back and finish the one about athletics. Yes, I, I, I think, yeah, in a way you are catching up, but in another, in another way you're really making the athletic department whole because you don't want to be playing catch up every year. Uh, hopefully this gives him some stability going forward. Again, we'll be working together to look at the costs, see where we're headed. Uh, to go to your other instructional materials. Mm -hmm. At the end of every year, as I have gone back and looked at uh, our program materials, we have purchased materials uh, in the month of June that we receive in August to start the year off in September. Uh, writing without handwriting without tears is one of those type of programs. That particular expense, uh, as we have done in the past, is for all the entire district is about twenty to twenty-four thousand uh, dollars for instructional materials. That's a consumable; it gets consumed during the course of the year. And we do normally purchase it at the end of the year, give lead time, so we get the, the materials in and get it into the classrooms. Uh, that's sorry, what constitutes what line that. What line are you looking at? The 24, the uh, the line that 2415. The 2415 isn't that the line you're looking at? That's other uh, instructional materials. And other yeah. instructional materials. Okay. So what were you saying about 24,000 then? That was the handwriting without tears uh, program that we have. Okay. That's what constitutes that that overage. Um, I do have another question. I have it for the department heads. There's certain things that I think that, you know, I mean, I understand some of the things need to go into next year and some of the things we have to make up, like, I guess, the athletic department, but there's other things that I would think that would be firm and set, and I'm just wondering on the athlete, on the department heads, what happened there that we're down almost 1500 1,004,99,25? Just give me your line item. 2120. Okay. 2120, department heads. Um, the the $1,500 that's on that line, I would have to back and look at every individual line item and again I have to close out the full year uh, there could be uh, an adjustment to that line I can't tell you for the, the $1,500 okay and uh, line 2430 general supplies <laughs> general supplies no no you don't 2440 other instruction oh, I'm sorry it's right below it yeah the one the 22 dollars yeah. No, yeah. one negative that was pretty close for $22. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, other instructional supplies? Yes. Um, again, it's it's one of those that if, if we bought a uh, software program for the library or uh, something else that we would normally buy with June monies to get it, get it into the schools before we start the next year, again, um, without running a detailed history on the activity within that count, I can't tell you just from this report, but I can tell you later. Um, we still have plenty of adjustments and transfers. And well, on that vein, I was wondering, um, is it always work like that, where uh, we buy in June for the following year, and yet we get, we get the bill here, so that we always have to budget differently? But that's the way I'll say we, we have always done it. That is probably fairly standard practice throughout all school districts, especially when you know you have a, such a long lead time. Uh, you have a, such a short window to get your uh, orders in, get the, pro get the product coming through the door, get it to the classrooms. If we were to wait uh, to place those orders during the summer, those pro the product would not be here on the opening day of school. Is there any way to order them earlier? So that maybe they give discounts or anything to. Um, I know that Hadley have done that, and I talked to Nicholas um, Young about that a bit back about that they had ordered in um, in advance and ended up getting things at a better deal, basically, and almost a year early. Some of them were. If you're ordering generic type products, it's your chances of getting a deal on different items is is fairly good. But if you're ordering a very specific and narrow program, you would be tied to that program, especially if we're endorsing it as part of our curriculum, our math program, or, or our uh, English uh, program, or, or our handwriting program, we're staying with a certain product. There really isn't the opportunity or any advantage to us to order that early. Okay. Line 4220, maintenance of buildings. 
that's down. I mean, that's 73.2%. Uh, 42 we, third. 20. The next oh, to the bottom. 20. Not, I'm not going over. Yep. Uh, maintenance to the buildings. Yes. All I can say is uh, uh, Central Services uh, did a great job in trying to keep their costs down for the year. Are we budgeting about the same amount next year? We are. I have one more question. Maintenance of equipment at 134.8. Is that another something that just like comes up now? I mean, there's... The maintenance of the 2430? Line 4230, 4230, yes. 4230? At 134.8%. Yep. That, that, is, that is over as a result of the Yactron unit, that's the dehumidifier unit that's located here in this building. We bought the unit for $7,000 and we spent $21,000 to repair that particular unit throughout the course of the year. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, that maybe as a partial answer to your question, that this some of the things are over and some of them are under, but it's not really, uh, when you asked about the athletic thing and we're budgeting 10,000, but they only were over 4,000 this year, and you said, so is that to help them make it up? This is really, it ends this year and next year as a separate animal. So the 10,000 is not 4,000 plus an extra six. The 10,000 is how much we, 10,000 more that we budgeted for next year than what we budgeted this year, but it doesn't, this, this negative number doesn't carry over to next year. Okay. Did that make sense? Yes. He balances, he's balancing this year's budget completely and totally this year and hopefully with luck it will come up to zero. Right. If there's anything left over in any of these lines where they spent less, he's probably going to do transfers to the lines where we spent more uh, and, and zero everything out. If we still had money left over, if we were another city department, we would be returning it to the city, and it would go into free cash. They don't usually, or up until this year, and I don't know that the current mayor is going to make this do. We never had to turn over what they call tailings. So we take that money and we get to spend it wherever, which is possibly one reason why they go ahead and order materials. But the reason that some of these are under, as you said, is because he put a freeze on a bunch of stuff. If you Call January. in January said nobody's spending anything, nobody's traveling, nobody's getting reimbursed for expenses, they didn't do professional development trips. A lot of stuff got curtailed just so that we would come in under on some of those things because we couldn't anticipate what was going to be. So this is a this is going to be a finite thing. It will balance out within this year, but nothing gets carried over unless it's encumbered for expenditures. Okay, I understood that. The only part I didn't understand that you were explaining is for the four thousand dollars that we ended up budgeting ten thousand dollars for next year when the budget just, doesn't seem to need it. Yeah, and it probably does need it, except that they they put a freeze on everything, and so Jim didn't spend as much as he might have. So he was only over by four thousand when he could have been over by ten thousand. Except okay. he didn't spend it, and exactly. they're going to have to buy, if I recall, they're going to have to buy new baseball bats and some other stuff for some of the other sports. They didn't buy the equipment this year, and a lot of that is purchased by booster groups and stuff like that. But I think they were just anticipating that the, the athletic budget has been over, kind of, for several years running, mm -hmm. and they just felt like that if we weren't supporting it in the way we should have in our budget. So they were trying to anticipate. I, you get it right. Really? Perfect. Thank, thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just trying to understand why we voted ten thousand dollars for athletics when um, it shows here that the supplies and whatnot, and we voted zero for supplies, and then yet the supplies are on the are are over also. So I mean, I just I think try to figure it out. The superintendent is the one to answer that question because he he those were some of his priorities. Okay. All right. right. The thirty thousand dollars in supplies that we did not fund was in lieu of uh, any more staffing cuts, and the ten thousand dollars for athletics is being balanced at eleven athletic account. Even though we purchased no supplies, no uniforms this year, we still didn't have enough money to be solvent zero. So we had to. I wanted to fund an additional ten thousand dollars so that we can actually purchase some things for the kids next year and cover the deficit. Thank you. That's it. You're all set? Thank you. Thank you.
I thought I'd first catch you up on the hiring uh, process that we're involved in. Uh, this week we've interviewed uh, candidates for the Director of Special Education and also we continue to interview uh, people for the Director of Innovative Instruction and Technology. We are down to uh, have a finalist coming tomorrow for the Director of Special Education and uh, very excited about that. Our committee worked uh, today to interview people and she was our unanimous decision, so we'll meet with her tomorrow. And our tech director, we have one finalist that I interviewed on Wednesday and we have our final interview on Monday. So I should have these two positions in place within the next week. And I'm, I'm really excited about the quality of the candidates and finalists that we have coming forward. And sorry for the districts they're going to leave. <laughs> Um, I wanted to share with you some of the highlights around the district for our summer work. We try to continue the work to dispel the myth that we all have summers off. So uh, Beth Chiquette had started and the new principal at Green Street. And uh, I'll begin with her. She had uh, Jenny Bender there working with teachers in literacy training. Uh, we had Jim Leon, a fifth grade teacher in the summer math program at Mount Holyoke. The kindergarten teachers and ESPs are in year two of training with the Tools of the Mind. The DSAC data training is working with the team from Grid Street uh, coming up in August. And the data warehouse study team will begin the analysis of the MCAS data, the new MCAS data. Over at the high school, English teacher Melissa Michael and the other ELL teachers from Jackson Street School, Kathy Milanowski, Gareth Adams, and Linda Barco participated in a two-day training session on world-class instruction design and assessment. Uh, their goal is to advance academic language and development in the students who are learning English. Nancy Ethis and Brian Lombardi are presenting an advisory session at the Principals Conference at Dallas uh, in two weeks. They will, also, they will do a presentation on developing successful advisories in year one and what to expect in year two. Leslie Scans Hodges from the Writing Project and Smith Vocational High School will do a workshop for the high school department chairs on how to roll out the new curriculum frameworks. Catherine Dollard and attended, this is hard to understand, but it's a really good thing. Catherine Dollard attended the Invent Team Eureka Fest at MIT. It was a week-long training on how to coach teams to develop successful grant applications. And at the end of the week, her team was given the Excite Award based on their invention middle. So a very productive week for her and her team. Catherine Dollard and Dan Moylan uh, will also participate in the BioI Science Education Program at Smith College. That's going on this week. The program instructs how to teach and enhance biological concepts and experimentation by observing life cycles. The teachers will learn how to use zebrafish for experiments in development and handling of behavior in the classroom. And we have that animal in school policy tonight, so this works out perfect. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and uh, Chris Brennan will be attending a week-long Mimsy AP seminar at Bentley College at the end of the month. Over at JFK, the teachers continue their professional learning and work in the summer. Uh, focusing on curriculum and instruction this summer. Math and special education teachers are collaborating in the second JFK cohort for formative assessment in the math classroom, facilitated by the Education Development Center. Math teachers are also participating in professional development focused on differentiated instruction and the math curriculum shift that we're making with the Massachusetts Math and Science Initiative. Guidance counselors are developing uh, a building-wide social norm some marketing campaign. English teachers Holly Graham and Diana Agent are revising the seventh grade unit plans to align them with the Common Core understanding by design methods. Family and consumer science teacher Sharon Martell will be developing lessons in child development, nutrition, and food. The art teachers Michelle Mallory and Herschel Levine are working on grade six to eight curriculum alignment and developing art history lessons. Stacy Burdick is developing Learning Strategies website. The Oceans 18 and will further develop their cross-curricular omnivore dilemma unit, focusing again on differentiated instruction. The Green Revolution teachers 
are working on technology and literacy and team curriculum based assemblies and activities. The JFK Literacy Across the Curriculum Committee will continue their work to support the implementation of common language, procedures, strategies, and tools to align teaching practices across the curriculum with the common core literacy standards. Social studies teachers Will Bangs and Dana Mack will work on new avenues to assess using technology web tools, programs such as Explain Everything, Live Binders, Edmodo, and Moodle. The reading and special ed departments will complete their training and benchmark assessment, and the members of the All School Read Committee uh, are meeting to plan the next JFK Reads, uh, which begins in September. Over at Ryan Road, the staff members uh, continue to deepen and extend their understanding and commitment uh, to the responsive classroom model uh, through summer study. Several new staff members will attend a week-long responsive classroom workshop. A team of three will participate in a new offering from responsive classroom, thanks to the generosity of the NEF. And a classroom teacher and two ESPs will be trained to lead responsive classroom study groups with their colleagues next year using books and study guides and videos provided from the program. They will become new responsive classroom leaders. Over at Jackson, uh, the Kim Gerald, the third grade teacher, is uh, working with the collaborative, uh, teaching American history, colonial through post-revolution eras. We have the ELP teacher working on program planning for the new ELP program. The, uh, Michelle Ambrose is coordinating three workshops on developing and aligning fourth grade curriculum with the Massachusetts frameworks. Uh, the new teacher evaluation system is being studied and uh, worked on through uh, Paula Welchman, the fifth grade teacher, who will conduct workshops for the teachers who were selected at the faculty to win participation in the new evaluation uh, in September. Uh, Maria Garcia is continuing her work in mindfulness uh, and she's at a practice retreat. Several teachers uh, participating in the workshops uh, did participate in workshops immediately after the last day of school with Barbara Black and Jenny Bender on literacy training. Um, and finally, uh, Mary Cowie is and a summer math for teachers developing mathematical ideas at Holyoke College and also will be uh, doing a summer math for teachers um, later on in the month on the mathematical leadership program. That covers the highlights going on this summer with our teachers and administrators. Um, Joseph, the principal, is on uh, vacation in Italy and did not send highlights. <laughs> I'm sure he'll get on those when he gets back. <laughs> Uh, and finally, I want to bring you up to date on the restructuring of the ETL positions in the special education. I'll give you an explanation of why those are needed, and what we're going to do with those positions, how it's going to change and improve our services, and uh, sort of explain the history here. Now, each school, even though we replaced the two positions that seem to be the same, each school has a different reason for wanting to do that and different needs to be met by making these changes. So I'll start with JFK. What the, the need they were trying to address is that they need more administrative input in the IEP team meetings. Uh, Leslie and Sal being the only two. Uh, a number of IEP team meetings that come up, uh, they were unable to attend. And so this is a move that will now be able to give uh, so people were having responsibility without accountability and uh, without authority, I should say. And that's that's really not fair. So we want an administrator in the IEP team meetings to be able to allocate resources and also to have an oversight into the continuity and the quality of services. Now if an administrator is in the IEP meetings that's also able to evaluate the programs and the personnel, we feel that this would be a step forward in, in strengthening our programs of special education. They want to continue to support the inclusion model and that the new associate principal will have all of the same duties as the ETL, but now we'll have the certification to be able to supervise and manage not only the initial meetings and the re-evals like the ETL did, but also to work with the evaluation of the people in the program. Leslie also notes that um, 
the current ETL, been in the position for three years prior to that, was Nathan Ziegler was the ETL here. And that was a new position because before the ETL was added, the special education teachers were responsible for all of this on their own. It really didn't seem fair to have that level of burden on the teachers. So they brought the ETL in. That was an incremental step forward. And now taking this ETL and making it an administrator with supervisory responsibilities, we see that as another incremental step forward to improve the services in special education at JFK. At the high school, the need uh, for this position came about because we needed two more teaching sections, uh, specifically for the 12th grade students uh, in the strategies classes. And up until two years ago, the ETL taught two sections of class and did the duties of the ETL. Um, we dropped that and put those students who would have been in class in 12th grade class, we blended them with underclassmen. So now we have seniors who have the needs of transitioning into the world of work or into post-secondary education in the class with the 9th and 10th graders. And it's difficult for the teacher to focus on the needs of the seniors. So Nancy and the team at the high school found that that wasn't the most effective way to work with our seniors. And she wants to have those two sections back and to have uh, the ETL serve an ETL role and teach two sections. But knowing that they weren't in the past, she didn't want to just go back to that. She wanted to increase the service and attention to special education by adding this associate principal who will be uh, the special ed department will be one of his responsibilities, that he will attend the meetings, he'll be able to supervise the programs and evaluate the teachers in special education. Uh, the ETL will still be the IP meetings and the three-year reavals, but now uh, we will have somebody who's able to supervise uh, and in, in the meetings be able to allocate district funds and manage district funds as well as uh, oversee you know, the continuity of services for special education. Does that help uh, explain what we did? Any questions? Just to, to clarify, um, it sounds like we're adding a new role, but it was a change in role as associate. Is that correct? There was a dean of, of academics. That's a good point. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. So it was unfortunate that the timing of the decision to make this change happened with the budget process because this wasn't a part of, there's no budget savings and there's no additional spending through this plan. The academic dean position at the high school would be cut. sections, two teaching sections that we picked up at ETL. And at uh, JFK, the associate principal will come in at, uh, I believe it's a no increase to the ETL salary. So, I might understand that the, so now the high school and the middle school will have, will have uh, somebody at the team meetings who has the authority to Allocation of resources. Right. We still need to get somebody who can do that at elementary schools for team meetings. Well, I believe they have. Somebody at the team meeting who can commit the district. This was an LEA. Do we have LEAs at the meeting currently? I don't know the answer to that. I have to ask the elementary school principal. I was going to say, I would assume that maybe with fewer students in a building that the principals at the elementary level could attend those meetings, but I don't know if that's the case or not. I would have to check. I don't want to guess at the answer. So, um, 
next on the agenda is um, something that we haven't done like this before. We're, we're going to do something that's unprecedented here in Northampton. Um, this is the time of year where the superintendent is going to, for the first time here, present his self-assessment. And we have a superintendent who has demanded of himself to be evaluated the same way that our principals and teachers will be evaluated under the new um, evaluation system. And what you have in front of you is a pretty um, uh, phenomenal document that the um, superintendent has put together for all of us. Um, I'm going to let him um, describe it, but I, what I want to say is don't just flip through it. This is really important information. Um, we're going to talk a little bit after about how the whole evaluation process is going to work. The um, superintendent evaluation process team uh, has already had the chance to look at this, and uh, we were rather impressed with the, um, the standard the superintendent has set for the district in terms of how to put together a self-assessment. So with that, I'm going to ask him to, to speak to it. I'd be very happy to do that. What, what is, one more thing. It's my personal belief that the most important thing a school committee does is evaluate the superintendent. So um, everything else that we do, to me, is almost secondary to that. Because if we don't have the kind of leader we want in the district, we're not going to be able to do anything else as well as we want to. So we want to support a superintendent who is doing well. We want to support a superintendent who needs work in any particular area. So in this, and here we are, and we're doing this publicly, and I would remind us that even though we don't have an audience and the mics aren't here, that we will, this is a public meeting and it will be broadcast. Um, I would ask us to, um, and we're not going to be discussing this tonight, but to keep in mind that, um, that this is a new process for us, that we are undergoing evaluation of a superintendent in a public setting. Um, and, um, and I'm really pleased that Brian has been so um, willing to be open in, in how he's doing this. This was not demanded of him. This was something that he agreed and chose to do. So, thank you. Thank you. So I will teach you a little about, a bit about how to use the tool and do the rating system. I'll do that in a second. I want to start by explaining uh, how this process will work starting in September for teachers, administrators, and for me. And one of the most important elements is that in September we set at least two SMART goals, one on professional practice and one on student learning. Um, because I came into this uh, process and came up with this idea in April, I wasn't able to go back to September and set those SMART goals. But I will be doing it in September, just like we're expecting of the teachers and the administrators. But what I did was um, work with the subcommittee to select 10 of the elements and indicators. Uh, and you'll see the rubric, I'll get to that in a minute, and then provide evidence of how I've worked toward and achieved uh, each of those categories. And I rated myself on each one, which is something that um, you will do. But after I finished that, I said, that part is really good, but it's not as comprehensive. Uh, it, to me, it didn't cover all of the work that I did this year. So I came up with the idea of putting a highlight page, uh, there are two pages that begin. I'd like to speak to those two pages, and then I will not, uh, I'll just walk you through the tool of how it, this book is assembled, and then you can come up with your questions and so forth uh, after you have more time to read it. When I sat down and looked at what were, what were the highlights of the year, where did I put my time and energy, and what would I say are things that I'm, I'm really proud of, and great accomplishments of the year. And I listed them in the first two pages. And going back to the beginning, um, we started the year with the convocation, the opening meeting here, I believe for the first time in the district, we included all of the employees in the district. And I thought that was important um, to start the year by saying all of us are educators and those of you who are there, and the theme of the speech was the power of one. Each one of us had to use our power and are encouraged to use our power to make the system better for children and to help improve student learning. I began with the entry plan project that you've heard a lot about through the year, and I feel that was a very important start to my tenure here in Northampton. Uh, the process taught me a lot about the system and the people and the community. It made uh, 
for me, I made it a priority to meet hundreds of people and commit hours to interviewing and learning about the system and then pulling that data together and setting the priorities, which I presented in January, and then it helped me to build the district improvement plan, which we did together in January. I think the Andrew plan is fantastic, one of the best parts of it. So you only do it once. Uh, and I think it's very important that you do it once and never get that second chance to make the first thing. Uh, but now, all the time that I committed to that last year is available time for me in year two. And I plan to, as the end plan was a priority, at the beginning of year one, my priority in year two is going to be our special education department. We have a new team, new EPL, new director, new supervisor, and I'm planning to commit my time and energy to developing our special education department as uh, much as I uh, committed myself to the entry plan. Uh, I changed the structure of our administrative leadership team, and the meeting structure, as well as the agenda. The agenda always began with a focus on instruction, student learning, about teaching methods, sometimes student data, and uh, we work together. The format changed in that I didn't uh, I don't sit at a table to pontificate to the group. We have an idea, we have a topic, we have an agenda, we can advance. As you'll see from the agenda, uh, that I get to soon, um, I give them ideas how to prepare for the discussion and what the outcome of the discussion is supposed to be. So we are very focused when we go to those meetings. They're often three to three and a half hours. And we start with at least an hour on student learning instruction, teaching them the strategies. That was and what is one principal comment to me, I feel like I'm back in college. And she said it with a smile. Because uh, we were, we're learning together. Uh, with the administrative leadership team, I changed the evaluation system and the format. Of course, we'll change it again next year because we're moving to the, this system. But I wanted to be focused. I wanted to be measurable. I wanted to be able to, for the principals to have accountable for their goals. And I wanted the goals to match their school improvement plans. So as the principal is successful reaching their goals, so is their school successful reaching their goals. One of the things we studied with our leadership team was the art of instructional rounds. And we treated this like a professional learning community with administrators. We studied a book together. We discussed how to set up the pilot rounds, and then we did pilot rounds, as you remember from the reports, at each of the schools, and some of the schools we did rounds twice. The idea is that first we wanted to learn how to do it, and then well, and next year the principals will do this with teachers, and teacher teams will do instructional rounds in their building. You know we had a new school improvement plan format. You helped me to develop the new district improvement plan, and uh, change that format as well. Uh, in the fall, slightly before I came in, we weren't in a good place for a collective bargaining agreement, and uh, I believe that I was able to assist and facilitating that process and to have that agreement put in place uh, and ratified in December. The weekly musings, um, I call this the sleeper hit of the year. I started the weekly musings just as a friendly informal memo to the school committee the all team. Some of the highlight things I've been thinking about, um, some of the things I was working on this week, it seemed to take on a life of its own. People really appreciated it and more people wanted to copy the, the musings and then some people were forwarding the copies of the to other people, so finally I gave up and put it on the blog. And so everybody can read my weekly musings, and apparently they do. But then that led to the idea of the stories of the month, which uh, Alden has given us that idea. We followed through on it, and I think that's been a fantastic addition to our website as well. We established a committee to learn more about the new educator evaluation tool. I know you've learned a lot about that, and you've heard a lot about our work on that. That, to me, is one of the most effective initiatives in our district, one of the most effective initiatives I've ever been a part of. The team that is around rolling out that tool and putting it in place for September is one of the most fantastic teams. And uh, really, they have set the standard for the state. And uh, in other state seminars, they're referring to the work that the Northampton team is doing, particularly because we're doing it so well and so effectively and with our union president as part of the committee. So it's really been a, a perfect initiative. My own personal professional development, as you've heard me talk about them in the 
Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, the cohort group I'm a part of. It's a three-year group. Uh, first year is the most intense, and then the meetings get uh, fewer as we go on to year two and three. But my coach, Kevin Corbin, uh, stays with me for all three years. And to me, that also has been one of the finest pieces of professional development I've ever been a part of. Uh, the support and the assistance of the state and of Kevin have been very valuable in helping me navigate through my first year as superintendent. But as you remember, I also went to the Harvard Leadership Conference. And there was a three-day conference back in March, which made a big difference in my work and in my perspective as a superintendent. And finally, at the end of the year, I worked with the teachers on the Teachers 21 workshop on how to set smart goals so that we uh, had a group, I believe, about 35 people here to educate teachers learning how to develop their goals for the new educator evaluation tool. We had a perfect storm of audits this year. I believe this happens once every 4,000 years that these all come <laughs> at one time. And we were lucky enough to get it. We had a financial audit of our FY11. We had the CPR mid-cycle review for special education. We were randomly selected by the Department of Education for an audit in February. And we had our NEAS 10-year evaluation all occur in my first 10 months of being superintendent. Enough about that. Um, there's also the unfortunate side of the job where there are legal issues that I have to navigate through and work with our attorney on. Um, we had a, we had a lengthy piece of litigation on uh, termination. We have a few personnel issues that come up through the year. And also, uh, I have the Clark lease agreement there. And though that didn't get to litigation, there's a lot of legal work that had to be done to prepare that lease agreement and to work with the teachers union, Clark, and our school committee to make sure that we successfully navigate this transition. I put down central office management there uh, because sometimes that's overlooked, that though I am, of course, responsible for the organization and the leadership of our six schools, I'm also leading and managing an office downtown, which includes HR and our staff uh, down 212 Main Street. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is the development of the relationship between the Human Resource Office and the school department. Uh, I brought Glenn Stoddard into our central office meeting. She became part of our core central office team when we every Monday at 9 o'clock and also added her to the alt team so that we could have more consistency in our human resources practices, hiring practices and evaluations. And that, to me, was one of the best um, things that I did as far as central office management. But of course, you know, throughout the year, um, there were a lot of changes and transitions that happened. And uh, that does take a certain amount of uh, time and energy to make that run smoothly. In technology, we developed a new website. I know from the school developed new websites as well. Uh, we all remember the Bridge Street principal search. To me, that was something that took a lot of my time and energy. And I was very happy and willing to do it because it was so important. Bridge Street principal, John McKenna, I've been there for 18 years, maybe 19, I'm sorry if I have that wrong, but when you're turning over a leader that's been such a part of that institution for so many years, I believe that it's a, a very careful process to involve so many people. I did feedback sessions with teachers, with parents, um, to find out what they were looking for, what they wanted in their hands principal. As you know, we went through the first search. Um, Howard served on that committee. It was a tremendous amount of time um, reviewing materials and interviewing people. And in the first search, I don't believe we found the right person. And I wasn't ready to just hire a principal. So it, it, it was a major decision to start the search over again. And uh, plenty of people could have questioned and did question that decision at the time. But the result is that we have, in my opinion, the perfect candidate for Bridge Street School. And so the weeks and hours and time that it took to do that, I believe, was absolutely worth it. Can I interrupt and say just kind of, I think of you know, part of that that you left out, but I think it's very positive, was uh, uh, you changed the process between the first and second principles, searches, um, sort of in response to the things we learned in the first. So I think that was really a very positive part of, part of that. You know, we noticed yeah, we, there was a good feedback loop. I feel like exactly that we improved the process from the first to the second. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. The budget development uh, for this year uh, with a whole new format for budget presentation, a whole new format for the 
budget discussion and the advocacy for the budget. I believe that I was respectful in my advocacy for the school, but also very direct in my political advocacy on what I believe is best for our schools. Uh, continue to navigate and provide leadership for the late start proposal. Um, depending on how you ask, that's going well or it's not going well, but um, it's going. And we are moving forward and I'm learning a lot through the process. I believe the people that are attending the forums are learning a lot too. Things have changed from the very first one to where we are now. And our next one on August 22nd, uh, the forum will be presented with a draft of a proposal that will be coming to the school committee in September. So that we're not just going to spring it on the community in September, they're going to take a look at it, have a month to ask questions and uh, be prepared for the school committee in September, the school committee meeting in September when I bring it to you. Uh, in curriculum, we are in our second year with the Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop. This has been a very important and intense initiative for our school district, and I believe that we are already reaping the benefits and will continue to reap the benefits of this work. It takes a long time to get an entire system of hundreds of teachers on board on a new curriculum strategy, and we've been committed to it. We're making great gains, and we're going to continue to be committed to it next year. When I came in through the entering process, one of the first things I heard about was our school choice process. People were concerned that the communication was not timely and the notification was not timely and we felt that parents were waiting to find out if their kids were coming to the or not or choosing other schools maybe because we were taking too long. We immediately speeded that up and had better communication with parents. We got people notified that their students had a seat in our schools and I feel that we greatly improved process this year. The Eat to be Healthy, uh, faculty community building triathlon, an idea I had in spring that I thought uh, we would start small, we'd try a triathlon, we'd have 8 to 10, maybe 12 people at best would try this triathlon. It would be so exciting that it would build year after year and we would grow into a huge triathlon that now has 80 people in it. Uh, I have Pleasantly surprised at the level of interest in this triathlon and the excitement around it. Every time I run into a teacher now, instead of just saying hi or shaking my hand, they tell me how many miles they ran this morning, uh, that morning, or they started swimming. Uh, so people are really excited about this, and um, people have said to me, "Our school district needed this. We needed something to come together that's fun. That's just us. It's not fundraising. It's not you know, promoting something else." us being healthy and enjoying this time together. And finally, I closed the year with listening sessions in each of the six buildings in the teacher lunchrooms and offered a uh, feedback letter to the staff on what I heard during those uh, feedback sessions. And that, to me, was very important because in the entry plan, when I went out and reached out to people and asked them for input, <clears throat> demonstrated my leadership style as a listener, but an active listener. I really listen to people and want to understand what they're asking for, and then I want to be able to deliver that or explain why I can't. And so part of going back at the end of the year is to find out, did I deliver what you were looking for, is there more that you that I can deliver next year, and what is it you feel I need to know now that I've had you for a year. The entry plan meetings were about learning the history of it. Now, tell me what we learned this year and what we can do better next year. And uh, that, that was very well embraced and those meetings were very well attended. So to me, these two pages summarize the work that I did this year, and I, I chose to include them so that I could give you a, the big picture of what I saw this year meant to me. Now we'll move to the, the tool, and as I mentioned, there are 10 elements, and they have indicators in them. I'll just ask you to flip to the first one so I can explain uh, how this booklet works. The first page you will see has the standard instructional leadership, and this one is specifically about how did I work to support diverse learners' needs. The rubric is there, and I rated myself as proficient, and I'm just going to, to explain why I'm proficient, because the definition is right there. Um, behind that page is the second page, again, with the indicator, and what I was working on, and this, in this case, there are nine things nine ways that I felt I went about meeting this objective. Now of those nine things, those will 
with the teacher and with an administrator, when you sit down with your evaluator, you would you speak for those. Those would be talking points. And so, with 10 people, I don't think that uh, I will be able to sit down and talk through all these points with you, nor would uh, our listeners at home want me to do that. Uh, but what I want you to do is look at those which you don't understand uh, or you need more explanation on. I would say that the school committee members would email me those questions and then I can compile those questions and bring them back um, to you in August and I can answer some of the questions. Now, obviously, if they're simple questions, I would just give you a call and say, well, it's on the other page. Not that, you know, but if, for more explanation, I think that there will probably be some similar questions and I should uh, speak to those with you. But I want to have, I want you to have a chance to read this before we do that, uh, so we won't do that tonight. Those are my talking points of how I met that goal, and when you flip that, you will find artifacts. So the artifacts will explain or help me to justify or serve as evidence as to how I work toward that goal. So for example, what you see here is an instructional rounds agenda. On the first page, the first thing I said I was going to do that I did to meet the first one of needs was instructional rounds. When we were in instructional rounds, one of the things we were looking for is tiered instruction. We were in the classroom trying to observe the tasks the students are being asked to do. Are those high level tasks and are they appropriate for Are you custodians please call the school office? Thank you. They're appropriate for all of the kids in the class. Put that over and you'll see uh, a memo that the principals wrote to the teachers but when we did instructional rounds. Obviously, there's a team of administrators moving about the building, and it sometimes raises suspicion. So I didn't want teachers guessing what we were doing there. And my goal was, after we did instructional rounds, by the end of that day, the principal delivered a memo to the teachers about what we did and what we discovered when we were on our rounds. And so you see one there from R.E. Riddle and one from Leslie Wilson following our visits. That is how this works. Let's flip to the next tab. Um, adjustment to practice. Again, I gave myself a rating of proficient to save the mystery. I gave myself a proficient in nine of the ten and exemplary in one. <laughs> and I'll show you that uh, as we get there. So each tab works the same way. There's the indicator. The next one is the sheet. The talking points of how I felt I met that and the artifacts. Now keep in mind that there are not artifacts for every single talking point. That would have made this document far too cumbersome. In this case, as I mentioned before, this is the new alt agenda. This is the format that I use and what the alt team receives usually five to six days before the meeting so they can prepare for the discussion. Any questions so far on the format of the book? Alright, so what your job is so look at each of these indicators. Um, give me a rating. Exemplary proficiency is improvement or unsatisfactory. And then in the end, under there are four categories. You will sum or you will blend those for each category. So there'll be four give it proficient exemplary four categories. And then those will be rated into one final rating. One. They will. But that's how the process works. Yes. Do you imagine we will use this page to do it? I thought that you, I provided that page so you could take notes. Okay. Um, because this is yours. Okay. Uh, so, I think you understand the setup of the book. I don't want to take you through that too much more, but I do want to point out, uh, if you go to the tab, Family and Community Engagement, 382, this is the only category I rated myself exemplary, and humbly. Uh, Say that because if you flip and you look at the talking points I had, I uh, decided to stop at 33, uh, so I didn't go on to page two. And uh, this kind of surprised me as I sat with Mark Prince and Nicole and Annie and uh, Tracy Harity to compile these uh, talking points. When we hit this, we just went rolling, and I realized how much I've enjoyed becoming a part of this community interacting with people with the community, businesses of, businesses of the community, and uh, that certainly turned out to be my, in my assessment, my highlight of the year. Uh, so tonight's not the evening where we're going to 
discuss the details of what's in here. If you have any questions about this format, this would be a good time to ask. Okay. So if not, what I'm going to do is um, um, the next item on our agenda is to talk about um, what the committee has been doing with the superintendent and where the process is. And I'll tell we sent to all of you to the superintendent to, to fill in if I miss anything. I just have a question. Um, are the teachers all going to do this? Oh, that's another part. I mean, we're all going to get focused on the teachers. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. No, you only supervise me. Okay. But so the principals are going to get books from all the teachers like this? What, what you, oh, it's an appointment. Okay. okay. So this is about um, our evaluation of the superintendent. So each of us, um, later this summer, will be filling out an online tool on SurveyMonkey that has all of these um, indicators from the rubric, which we passed, which the team passed out to you a month or so ago um, and gave you a chance to comment on the indicators we chose. There were something like 40 that we could choose from and we chose 10. Um, knowing that superintendent and principals and teachers are, well, can't all choose all of them, can't focus on all, you choose the ones and we chose as a group the ones that we thought were most important for this superintendent to focus on in this district in this year. Okay, so, um, and next year they can change or not, we can repeat some and not others, um, depending on how we, what we feel are the um, priorities in any, any year from now. So we will all be, each be getting that rubric. Before then, the um, administrative team will be getting the same rubric to fill out. It's not an evaluation for them. They do not evaluate, we evaluate. But we're asking them for feedback because they have a perspective on the superintendent's work that we can't possibly hold. We're not there when he is supervising um, them. We're not there when he's doing the walkthroughs to the building. We're not in all meetings. Um, so they hold really important information. And we made it very clear when we were in the hiring process that we only had, that we only wanted to hire a superintendent who was going to be open um, and willing to have information from the person that he supervises, uh, people that he supervises, and not only was he willing, he was wanting it. Uh, was very important to, to Brian. So they will all be getting um, the same survey monkey tool that we're getting. Um, it will be anonymous for them. Um, there's no way to track where it's coming from. Their email doesn't show up. Um, and that's what they will be doing. In addition to that, we've come up with an additional tool that will be going out to all other staff members in the district. Um, this is for um, staff from all six of our unions and then um, representatives as well. So everybody will have a chance to be giving feedback. They will not be filling out this rubric because as you can imagine, a lot of this has to do with curricular work, and that's not going to be applicable to everybody in their role. But we're asking um, questions um, um, that are, I think, from the copy of the tool. Oh, you have it. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll, I'll let you know what those questions are, you know, just so that the school committee is informed. There's some demographic questions, nothing specific. All, all of these will be um, um, anonymous unless somebody chooses to share a name, but we're, we are asking for um, kind of where their job is in the district and what kind of job it is, um, how long they've been in the district. And then we're asking, some of the questions are very generalized, but every place there's um, room for comment, and that's true on the rubric for us and for the administrators as well. And in fact, any reading of, at the extreme of either unsatisfactory or exemplary requires a comment. Um, and anywhere else along, especially for, for those of you who haven't done this before, the more information that you can give to us um, in terms of comments, the more feedback the superintendent has in terms of um, designing his goals for the next year. So the questions for the staff have to do with visibility in the, in the schools, um, how accessible um, the superintendent is, if, um, if the su superintendent has been making sure that there's timely information coming from central office um, to the staff, um, if their professional development needs are being met, um, if the superintendent is demonstrating respect for human differences, uh, if the superintendent effect, um, understands the day-to-day -day challenges of each of their jobs, um, if he's aware of curricular development and its impact on student achievement. And some, some of these will might, might not be applicable for all of our staff, and they will have to 
pick and choose which ones they want to um, um, fill out. Um, asking if the superintendent is leading the district effectively and whether he has a clear vision for the district. And then ask some budget questions if the budget is being managed well and if they feel informed about that process. Um, and then anything else anybody wants to add, and that's true for, for staff, for administrators, for us, there's, there's room for that. Um, we are going to have those two online tools up uh, sometime next week. Um, and we're going to give them, um, I think it's we've set it at two weeks time to get that address um, so that we have that information that the um, evaluation team can um, compile and um, present um, to the school committee in August in a, not in specifics, but in a general way, so that uh, and not at school committee, we're going to have that information available um, for you so that it can inform you while you are filling out your evaluations. We will be filling out our evaluations in August after our meeting, and um, at that point, um, the team will compile all the survey monkey tool will compile all the data. We will compile a summary that will be read into the public record, much as we've done before, but from different sources of information, into the record in September. This is a more delayed process than we had originally um, planned for. This is the first time we're doing this. This is a learning ex experience for us. And in our meetings, we've come up with some um, kind of logistics that we might not have, for that we didn't foresee, that has delayed the process. And the superintendent has been willing to, as he said, do this right rather than do this on, on time. And so he's been willing to um, delay uh, what will be the start of his contract negotiation for the next year until all of this is complete. So that we will be able to use um, this evaluation to inform him as he, as he designs his goals with us. Um, the other thing that will be different this year is the vice chair alone. That will not be compiled in this um, summary alone. The team will do it together so that we can assure the public as much as we can as possible, not just one person writing up the summary. Anything like that you want to add? Or is it only a reminder that uh, while we will be compiling, while the survey movie will be analyzing data, we will be compiling summaries and, and reading a summary into the record that's the official word. Anybody, this is a public meeting, and this is the biggest change in the open meeting law and, and the practice is that anybody can comment in the session. Any one of the school committee members can say whatever they want to and all of it is open and you can read it in the press. So part of what we've discussed is not to try and, um, it's, it's in no way intended to hide or control access to information but rather to, to time it and plan it out so that it, you're not getting the evaluation um, in phases so that it loses its impact. We'd like to be able to present the summary of the evaluation and have us control what we feel like is the importance to, to say. And then other people can say whatever they want to after the fact, but I don't want it to be before the rather have the, our, our summary be the first thing that we hear. Okay, so we will clear the timeline. We're, our evaluation, we will ent essentially enter it on the survey month. Uh, when is our August, window to do it? After the August meeting. So not before that? Correct. First, we're you going to get the information you. from the administrators and the staff to help inform us before we write ours. So often the questions are, you look at it and you go, well, how would I know that because I wasn't in the meeting. I don't know how he, right. you know, how he interacts with me except when they are here at a kind of meeting with us. So this is our opportunity to hear from other people what their perspective on it is and then use that. They're not evaluating Stephanie said that. We are the only ones who evaluate and you do have to trust your gut. But this is information from people who work day to day with him. So the, so, it can inform so the your survey you were talking about will be online in a couple of weeks. It's not our survey. Next week. It's, week. Next week. Next week. It's, it's not our survey. It's staff surveys. There will be a connect ed call going out reminding everybody that, or letting everybody know, actually, never mind, informing them that those are there for them to do. Okay. And they'll have two weeks to do it 
try to take into account that people may be on vacations. And then we'll, we'll have that data. Their evaluation, their, not evaluation, their feedback is not a public document. What the administrators and the staff fill out is not public. But the team will compile what's um, significant in that to inform us. I just want to mention something that's going through here from the MASC mentioned to me, the Association of School Committees, which was that um, it's not in any way an attempt to kind of uh, minimize the legitimate concerns people may have about the superintendent's performance. Um, but he basically said, um, he just recommended uh, school committee members when they're discussing evaluation, to think carefully before they make off-the-cuff remarks about the superintendent and about the job he's done, that it's much better if you get the things in writing when you've had a chance to think of things. So if you're going to speak publicly about his performance, just think carefully before you say it, because it's potentially going to live on Google or on the Gazette Net forever. So. Your, your digital legacy is... Yeah, so... So this is a very different process for our school committee for, across the state. It's very different. The first time that we are doing a um, this evaluation process in the public, it's a learning year for us. Um, so next year we will be better informed about the time timelines for when to get these things out. We'll go earlier next year, and um, and so not only do we want feedback about the superintendent's role this year, but we would also um, welcome feedback about the about the process itself to help us. Um, make it more efficient and more uh, effective um, next year. She said we'll go earlier next year. It may seem like we're doing it on the heels of this one because we may actually be engaging in this in the early to the spring next year in order to get on the right timeline. But because of this contract, this contract is, uh, what, James? Started, right? but you started in September, but it, well, it started in August, but it's still going. I started August 1st last year. I drove still June 30th. To June. Right. So his renewal date is June. So if you want to give him, a, you know, he has a three year contract, but I mean, compensation needs to be decided, but also as you near the end of that contract, there's a renewal date. If you need to notify him a certain amount of time before, we need to be doing this process much earlier in the year than we've typically done it certainly way earlier than we're doing it this year. So it may seem that it's coming around in less than six months the next time, right. but that's designed to get us back on schedule. And I will actually should. say that it's always been my pet peeve that we've done this during the budget season because we're so focused on budget. I always feel like we're evaluating the budget process rather than the superintendent's year. So I'm actually glad to know that we're going to be doing it only before the budget season is or before we're really any other comments or questions about how this process is going to work? Again, this is an unprecedented document. To spend time with it, okay, the superintendent's worked really hard to um, to bring this to us. It is a fabulous model for the rest of our district. Um, he has set the bar high for what what expectations could be for our um, administrators and teachers. Um, please give it the respect that it deserves. This is, I believe, our most important job to spend time with so that you can fill out your evaluations, not by just you know, checking off the box, but by really um, thinking about um, the rubric, um, the, the artifacts that are presented to you, any other information that you have on your own in terms of your experience with what we've gone through over the course of the year, and use the, um, the, the, the blank space to write as much in the way of commentary um, as you wish. to Lisa for a vote on the um, animals in the school's policy. Well, I have, I have a couple, a couple of questions. First one is the minutes from the first meeting in June say that we will vote on this policy after the next meeting of the rules and policy subcommittee, and we haven't had one to this So I don't know if you all are ready to vote on this policy or not. This is the same revisions that you saw in June. With revisions that were supposed to have been put in last meeting in summer, I did a lot of historical research on this last week and figured it out finally. So, so 
that's my first question is whether you're prepared to vote on it this evening or not. I would be. I would. I would propose one amendment, but um, it's a very simple amendment. It's striking a couple of words. Um, the, the second thing, which I just wanted to note, which I can't remember if I told Annie or not. You may have been on vacation. I just found it uh, ironic that the stories of the month included an article about the chicks hatching at Leeds. And the first thing here says baby chicks. That, um, <laughs> that chicks and duck, baby chicks and ducks are not appropriate animals to be in school. Because of the high risk of selling them. And I was just like, okay, well, so there we go. <laughs> We're violating our own policy right off the bat. Can I just talk about the amendment I have So I think we have to have a motion to pursue. So if, if everybody else is ready, then I'll move. Would you remind me you weren't going to vote on this until you really went, uh, went back to the House? Was there something you were sending it back for? I don't remember. I just read the minutes for tonight's meeting. And it's because we had a big, long discussion. It was yeah. so late. <laughs> yeah, I think it was going to go back, back there for something, but I don't. I, I frankly don't remember what. And I think it was expected that there would be a rules and policy subcommittee meeting long before this. I just so. didn't know if we were sending it back to them for some revision. Do you so all feel comfortable moving forward toward a bill? If so, I need a, uh, a motion. Well, I'll go ahead and make the motion. I'm, I move and the, and the rules and policy committee recommends that we approve the animals and school policy IMG. Second that. You know, somebody can vote to at some point in time to table it. So, um, how are you presenting to discuss it? You know, basically, I, I feel like um, the preamble is really good. Um, I think it leaves one sort of general thing out, which is the, you know, I read somewhere in the last year that kids learn academic material better if they had more real knowledge as well, real you know, world things. Um, and I, I know that sort of why, I think that's summed up in a lot of ways why it's desirable to bring animals into schools, not just um, for the purposes of demonstration or enhance a specific lesson, though it's not merely as an adjunct to an academic lesson, but it's also important just so that they know something real. So then for some unforeseen lesson, they have a reference for it, so that it's not just a word on the page. And this, so, so in other words, having some experience actually being around animals, which it's funny talking about this, but as our world gets more and more digital, <laughs> there is less and less of that. And um, you know, so it'll affect, it'll affect all sorts of things, from just reading and writing, in other words, knowing what they're talking about when they talk about an animal, or the way it feels, or sounds, or something, um, and be able to write about that to science, which has an obvious sort of lesson-based application, but I think in the larger thing, like just the reading and writing literature, being able to appreciate literature, where it talks about things in the natural world, if you have really had very limited contact with the natural world, which an awful lot of kids have, partly thanks to our concerns about things like salmonella, um, <laughs> you're really limiting their education. And, um, I'm unaware of any salmonella outbreaks from our schools over the whole time I've been here. And we've had rabbits hopping around on the floors of classrooms, and you know we've had all sorts of things which would not be allowed under this policy, but have caused no problems, and were actually a valuable part of my children's education. So I'm concerned <laughs> that in the name of safety we end up bleaching life, you know, out of our schools. <laughs> And um, so I'm all for the risk reduction, but I don't believe we can eliminate risk. I don't think it's possible. And so rather, but I do think we could eliminate, you know, actual hands-on learning and experience. And I'm afraid that this policy will go in an attempt to eliminate risk, will fail to do that, while nonetheless managing to eliminate a viable part of kids' education. So, the, the small amendment I would offer, which is down here, um, 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 is it number guiding principles? Yes, it's number two. 
you know, uh, I think it's good for people to review the potential for allergic reaction and potential health risk. But I don't think that it, it's, it's superfluous to decide whether animals are integral to the goals of the curriculum. They are. I think what we've decided is we want our children to know about the world and animals in the classroom is a good way for kids to learn about the world. So I don't, I think that actually is implying that somehow or other an animal has to be there for a specific lesson or experiment as opposed to just simply for the value of knowing more about it. And um, so I would, my amendment is to um, eliminate every, put a period where there's a comma and eliminate everything else in that number two guiding principle. I'll second that amendment. So now we're having discussion on the amendment to um, delete the second half of the sentence from guiding principles number two. I agree with Howard. I think that um, to know in advance all of the benefits that you're going to have by having animals and exposure to animals isn't isn't able to be, you know in the curriculum necessarily as much as just the fact that they are around animals that they learn about animals. I agree with. Lisa, um, are you aware of how much of this is state mandated and how much of this is our choice? This is, um, Amy may have to help me out since she's the historian on this, but I believe that we, we had a policy about animals in schools and we got something from the state that said that we had to have a policy on service animals. We said, well, heck, we already have a policy on animals in school. Why are we having a separate policy that says we have to have service animals? We have to allow service animals. So, or, you know, we, we have to allow them within certain constraints and we have to be careful that the service animal doesn't hurt somebody else. So, so in trying to balance all of that stuff, we were trying to insert the service animal into our general animals and school policy. Yeah, uh, I believe Dr. Same. Erickson took this on as a project of his own and sort of rewrote the entire policy, combining the two policies together, and that's where a lot of the confusion about this policy is coming in. But I think we have it worked out what his intentions are and both of the same policies together in one policy. And was um, Karen Jobs in support of this? Absolutely. Yes. And on, on many levels, So this question that Howard has raised, was that brought up in Wilson Policy? Yes, but no, it was, it was somewhat brought up. It, it was kind of more skimmed over as far as any time. I mean, how can you word, everything's beneficial, beneficial all, you know, as a learning experience, so how are we going to, to define it? And I, I think that that's kind of why we decided to meet again to discuss it because of that ambiguity. I, I, I would suggest that we all hope and that the study is probably true that the teachers are bringing in the classroom certain goals in mind. But I think <clears throat> to say that all animals are beneficial all the time. And, uh, and so I would that's why it's gonna have the approval of the principal. Well that's what I would say. <laughs> I would just change the, the word will decide to make this up. There's something that's clearly not something that's going to reach the curriculum goals. The principal means. I think it's a I think maybe it'd be more appropriate that it should be in the negative. That it, if it's going to be saying something other than simply striking it, it's simply say we'll decide whether animals in the classroom are just are, are, are preventing the class from reaching the goals of the curriculum. Those, I agree. If you had like a caged lion in every classroom, that would probably be detrimental to our goals as a as a as a, as a, as a, as a you know district. Um, it doesn't get better with lion in the classroom. Exactly. Um, so 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 I think it's maybe we just don't want the animals to be a distraction, but I don't know that we need them to be you know have a focus or sort of, you know justification. That's, I'm trying yeah, to I know, that's what I'm saying. That's what, that's what I think. Okay. So I'm, I'm wondering, actually, if it might be more um, efficient to come up with whatever concerns, questions we have, and send it back to the way that's we what we did last time. We're going to do <laughs> it. <laughs> so if we could highlight, Annie, that that's one of the, the questions. And so 
uh, we have a motion on the table that we would need to withdraw if yeah, we were going I to think table this motion something for amendment would need to be withdrawn. Yes. And then the, the regular motion, yeah, yeah. and the okay. just needs so to be So are you willing to withdraw your motion so that we can send this back? Uh, absolutely, and I love sending this. So. The whoever seconded the motion? I will be happy to withdraw the motion with the understanding that it will be taken up at a subcommittee. And I will withdraw my second. Okay. Well, do we need to vote on the withdrawal motion? Uh, no. No. Okay. And so then the motion on the table is to accept this. And um, so I would ask if there are any other questions that we want to send back. And I actually have one. But, um, well, I was going to uh, make a motion to table it until, and send it back. But I'm not quite sure about the Why don't we see what other questions there are and then we can table with all the um, questions that we have that we want to send back. Anybody else have any other questions? I do. Young. Handling of these animals by young children is not permitted. We, we have specific grades. Can you so, where you are? Um, general guidelines, baby chicks. Then the next highlight is reptiles, thorough washing. Okay. And that's the third one, the third one after reptiles. Does that mean you not wash the hands? By young children is not permitted. I was just suggesting, I'm thinking to be sent back that young is that K, one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, Everybody's I, yeah, I know. <laughs> As my baby's getting older, she's still my baby. <laughs> so, does this refer only to the animals that are listed in the bullet point above? Reptiles? Well, if it is, then I'm just suggesting any, um, bringing up that any time it does say young, if it says it's so that we need to define. Since that's a question, can we just highlight that bullet point? And yeah. Similarly, it says children should never be asked or expected to clean animal cages. I mean, who are children? Uh, and certainly in the somebody's child, but certainly in the older elementary school thing, and the elementary kids, we do that, so can we look at that one also? Okay. So and the one that you I get would, that Annie? Yeah. The children one I would raise? Children. Um, under guidance principles number five. Those mm -hmm. animals that may remain in the class beyond the instructional unit, so we think about the classrooms that have their guinea pigs and their gerbils who are in there all year, um, as determined by the principal, must be in an enclosed cage, frame, or some similar habitat where students may view but not be able to touch the animal. That has certainly not been the practice. The animals don't, don't just sit in the cage, the, the kids take care of them and they get to touch them, so we look at that. I know we had baby chicks. Um, I think to, to ban them from the building is is kind of uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, doing I think what we're hearing on this on this second looking is that the school committee has concerns that we've gotten a little too strict. So if, if perhaps you could invite Karen Jarvis fans to your next school policy meeting, find out what is mandated and what is our our discretion. So. If there aren't any other points that we want to specify, but know that you're going to look over them all with that in mind, um, is there somebody who would like to make a motion to um, table the, I'm the motion that's going to be on the table to refer back to the policy? I'm going to postpone until after the afternoon. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to send this back to rules and policy and to postpone the vote until after rules and policy has been made and changed. Sure, but I think we have to vote on the motion to withdraw as well. Which the, there was a first and second, but there was a motion and second, but not a vote. So we don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. There's a guy with that, and we're out of old business. Does anybody have any other business to raise? Does anybody have any new business to raise? Anybody? Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> In our future business and meeting dates, um, Rules and policy, are you meeting on July 19th? Okay. Rules and policy would like to wait to meet until we have a break from 10, whatever the 10 
technology and give us the support for this policy with that. And also to make sure that Karen goes to our state school. We, we may end up having two meetings because we have the Facebook and authorized user policies to do with the technology director, and we have animals and something else to be determined and posted. So I don't know if it'll be our next meeting, and I don't know when that will be. Okay, so school committee will have its um, retreat with the um, alt members on August 1. 4.30 to 7.30 at um, this to be determined? That's at Smith Valley. We've the last one. Okay. And our next meeting will be on August 9th. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.